we got a great season coming up. This is the first filming we're doing for season 14. Mark went to our producer and says, hey, we need to make sure 14 is over the top and perfect. I'm gonna be heavily involved overseeing things. The producer reached out to me and says, hey, I'm struggling. Can you cut? <laughs> Coming to get you, Barbara. In Springfield, Oregon, dead Mopar muscle cars are coming back to life. Restored by Mopar master Mark Warman. Joined by his out of this world cousin Dougie. Oh, hi, Mark. His apprentice. And daughter, Alyssa. Whoa, whoa, stop. And his childhood best friend, Royal. Mark hates everybody. His protege painter, Will Scott. You got one job. This is Graveyard Cars. We've done a lot of seasons at Graveyard Cars. Meet me, but I gotta tell you, I'm most excited in recent years over this one. My buddy Royal's back and there's so much fun stuff for everybody. You're gonna really enjoy this season. Feels great to be back. I love being around these cars. They're fun to work on. You know, I get a kick out of working with Mark. He's, he gets pretty animated during the process. It's always fun to watch, um, interact with him. You know, being friends for so long, it's, we've been working on cars since we met. I'm excited for season 14 because it's a whole different way of doing things. We've got a great group of guys, you know, from our producer down to our audio guy. So it's kind of like a breath of fresh air when you have new people come in to take over new roles. So I'm really excited to sit back and see how this season comes out. It's gonna get really crazy. My dad's gotten older, not wiser, crazier. Will's had another baby, so he's a grumpy old man. And uh, we have some really cool cars. I'm excited for all the cars, you know, all the cars we get to work on. All the colors, pretty colors. The cars. I mean, if you just take one quick look through that shop, the cars are absolutely amazing that you're gonna get to see. We got a 69 RTSE, we introduced it a few years ago, 444 speed, probably only a handful of those cars built. There's no real breakdown on the SE and the RT with a four speed. A car I'm super excited about is Wendell's 1971 Cuda. Yes, we've done a bunch of them, but it is cool because it's a Hemi car. But bigger than that, Wendell's a great guy. The backstory's great. The guy comes in, it's just a top notch client. So. You know when that car's all done and sitting there, he'll be crying and, and just overwhelmed with happiness. So there's different aspects of why you can be excited about a car, but Wendell's the reason why I'm excited to get that 71 Cuda done. We've got Miss Beautiful, Lovely, and Very Patient, Cindy D'Agostino's 1970 Challenger RT, Plum Crazy White Top, White Interior, White Longitudinal Stripe. Our Daytona that Tony and I fought back and forth whether to restore, well, it's restored. We have a few items to put on it and it's ready to go home to its owners. We have a 1970 Cuda here that's Panther Pink. Kind of sucks that we're not doing the actual full build on it, but we're doing the body in paint. But I'm super excited to do this car because A, it's my favorite color, and B, we've never done it. I've never sprayed it, we've never produced a car. So I'm hoping when that car comes through, which it's really close, Mark can convince the owner to let us just finish the car and build it out. For those of you who have been watching back in season two, our 1969 and a half Dodge Super B, 440 six pack, four speed super track pack car in F6 green goes home this season. The 69 GTX is finally going away. That's the blue on blue car, 440 Super Commando. We also have a 1970 Barracuda Cuda Tribute Car, 446 barrel silver sport, six speed transmission. One of our few A bodies, the 69 Cuda 383 four speed A57 car is waving bye bye to graveyard cars this season. And 25 other cars throughout the body in the paint shop that are in different stages of progress. Doug's got 10 engines built out ahead of the cars coming through. Another cool thing about season 14 is we have a new producer, but he's got no fresh ideas. So when I'm sitting there trying to help the guy out, he doesn't give me a chance. What? Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> so you want a full docket for graveyard cars this season? Just stay tuned. We got it, I guarantee it. Since the last time you saw us, we've even grown bigger. Graveyard Cars has really taken off. The lot is full of cars. We have, I think, over 50 cars that are completely disassembled right now, waiting to go through the shop, plus the 20 cars that are in progress at the same time. Now, what that equates to is space. 
When we moved in here, we had 18,000 square feet, give or take, and three and a half acres. It's full. So now that we're disassembling all these cars and trying to get ahead of the curve so we can have the new parts ready to go on the cars when they come through the shop, we have to find space for them. So what I've invested in is these little eight foot by seven foot storage units. So I can put one car in one storage unit. I'm able to go three high with them. So I just took advantage of 20 feet in the air that I wouldn't normally. The body shop is full of cars in all different stages. You go from one end of that thing to the other and you won't see that many good quality collectible Mopars anywhere else in the world in those stages. We want to continue to grow and get bigger and faster and to do it, we have to be organized. That's what you see at Graveyard Cars and that's what you've missed since we've been gone. Hey, <laughs> some things never change. Will, Will said you were in here writing checks. Chromium Diome side. I'm really excited because my friend Royal's back. I haven't been this excited about working on graveyard cars in years, since pretty much since he left. <laughs> I was just telling everybody how we met. First time I met Mark was in junior high. I think we had a health class together. We met in junior high, Never remember? We went to junior high together. You went, yeah, we did. No, we didn't. You get a little bit older, memories can get a little bit sketchy. I met you on the paper route that I got from Harding, right? I just want to get rid of my paper route so I could get another better paying job. I asked him, I said, well, don't you need some, some cash, some bump some burners? And he goes, no, man, I need my space. <laughs> How do you need space? I did not find a better paying job. My job after a paper route was at 7-Eleven putting groceries away. It's one paper route. It takes you an hour in the morning. I usually ended up eating my wages and red licorice, though. Yeah, but we Date. went to junior high together because that's, that's where we met and then PE class, I believe it was. But the idea that Royals concocted that somehow we met in junior high and then just magically I get a phone call from the Eugene Register Guard and I meet Royal and in my brain it's for the first time. Not delusional. What? You told yourself you weren't gonna go down that road. He's your friend. You should listen to yourself. He's back and I'm gonna listen to myself. I'm not crazy. I went to seventh and eighth grade at St. Alice. Good, good, good school. Then I went to Springfield Junior High where I was picked on and tortured because of the tumor in my foot. Royal? Never went to junior high with Royal. You book photo, Springfield Junior High, 1978. Where would you find something like that at? They didn't even have them. Oh. Yes, that's right. I I did, yeah. Oh, we went to junior high together. I thought you meant high school. How do I even know this isn't Photoshopped anyway? Photoshop wasn't around in 1978, Mark. Oh, oh there's Dawn. She was cute. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to have you back. We are jammed Thanks. to the rafter. You see all those I cars? I see that. I see all those cars out there. Your first task is I need to put some air in a tire and get Goldberg's car moved around here. After Mark had lost his dad, uh, he quit, you know, he dropped out of school while his dad was sick. And then right after that, ended up having a tumor on his foot. So he really, he didn't come back to school for a few years. Uh, there was a time when I didn't trust Royals. Uh, he did end up going and finishing at the community college. Uh, got his diploma, could have walked with our class, chose not to. Mark's not really a people person. Now you will go straight to hell if you start making up stories. <laughs> I'll see you there. I would uh, cut class in the 10th grade and go over and work on motorcycles at his house. And then, you know, naturally progress right into cars. The cars would really have kept us friends. <laughs> I'm glad to be back. Can you get Goldberg's car inside for me? I could do that right away. I just need some help right now. I'm getting ready. I got a phone call coming in. Uh, yeah, hang on a second. Um, Cameraman cracked up. It's the kind of jokes I do. Spontaneous. Chevy Chase is So anyway, yeah, All you're, right. you're probably right about how we met, buddy. Probably. And I never took any PE classes with you. So. Yeah, you did. Probably some other good looking guy you're thinking of. This is not what I expected to be doing when I came back, but hey, whatever it takes to get the job done. I am a good team player. I hope he remembers that. I hope he remembers that in my paycheck. Alyssa and I are getting ready to do an inspection on this 1970 CUDA 446-barrel four-speed car. You recognize the car, right? Of course. Mr. Bill Goldberg's personal car that he sent to us a couple of years ago. Remember when it showed up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice car. Eight, nine years ago. 
Well, it's been about two years. Okay, yeah. I don't know. 446 barrel, four speed. How many were built? 70 CUDA? 11. Uh, 904. Don't get me wrong, I love working with Alyssa and I love teaching her, but I kind of decided that she has what you call delayed learning skills. And if it was an automatic, how many would there be? I love this, this is fun. Yeah. So he'll throw out questions for me when we're filming and I've had no preparation at all. So I have no idea. I haven't looked, looked up the Fender tag or the build sheet and I don't know, so maybe 400. 853. 853. They, they went heavy on those, okay. Yeah, they went heavier on. This is a black car, black interior, V-code. 446 barrel, D21, four speed. It's an A33 track pack car, meaning it has a 354 Dana in it. Very rare, very desirable. In fact, it's an N96 shaker hood car. That wasn't mandatory. Only mandatory shakers were on Hemi's. I would like to take some time with Alyssa and go over the car. This is a great opportunity to show her how to validate a car before disassembly. So today's an exciting day. I'm getting ready to spray the nose cone and the lower valance for our 1969 Daytona. This is a 440 automatic car that we introduced a few seasons ago on Graveyard Cars. Tony D'Agostino was out. We looked at the car. We made a decision that we were going to restore it. But it was really a nice car to begin with. And it was a one owner car, which is really unheard of, too. That car is so close to going home. The only things that are left are a few interior pieces. I think the dash needs to be put in it. The seats need to be put in it. The nose cone needs to be painted. And the rear spoiler needs to be installed on it. These are the last parts and pieces I have to do. It's the first time I've ever even done a Daytona, you know, especially these pieces. And I know everybody at home, it's not a big deal, but to me, doing something I haven't done before, even though it's the same process, super easy to do, it's still something different and I like it. Bill believes all the numbers match on this car. Now, if they don't, I'm gonna let you call them and tell them. Probably, if they don't. no. If they do match, I'm gonna call them and tell you them. You were good at this, remember? Yeah, but what's he gonna do, beat you up? Oh, I see. So I met Bill Goldberg at the last shop we were at. So he is a super nice guy. I'm still starstruck every single time I see him. It's, it's just crazy, it's Bill Goldberg. I grew up watching him. Let's take a look at this. You are scared. I'm not scared. Okay. okay. I don't wanna have to go to prison because I pulled a 187 on the World Wrestling <laughs> Federation champion. Okay. Okay, you see the rust, right? Yeah, that's... This has been going on for a long time. I saw signs when it first got here that it was delaminating. That's what you'd call this, delaminating. This hood failure is a great opportunity to teach Alyssa how that happened and why it happened and how we can avoid it graveyard cars ever having it happen. Break off a nice little chunk of this right here. It's not looking good. Okay. Uh. See the backside, see some rust here? Yeah. See how that's black? Mm-hmm. And how that's black? Mm -hmm. And the only difference between the two blacks is this has some scuff marks in it that match the scuff marks in the metal. Yeah. Somebody painted directly over bare metal with the finished product. You never do that. The metal wasn't clean when it was painted. It didn't have the right product put over the bare metal. And then after that, it didn't have enough material put on it. Those are three of the killer signs that will cause paint to fail. Metal has to be sealed with an epoxy. You have to use, like in our case, we use DP90. DP90 is a two-part epoxy that is designed to neutralize rust. And the rust I'm talking about is a flash rust, which means the second we're done with it, it already starts to rust. And that gives me about a day or two to get on top of it. And look at how thin it is. There's hardly any material there at all. If it's too thin, the sun will break that paint down and it'll also delaminate, even if you have good substrates in it. So it's interesting to see what happens to the paint when you don't prep the metal correctly. At first, the paint may look beautiful when it leaves the showroom and the client must be happy, but over time you can tell that this wasn't done correctly. I mean, look at the hood. Yeah. If anything, you want to be careful of not getting too thick, right? Yeah, because if you get too much millage, that's right, I taught her that too. You get too much millage and then you can have a failure too because it can crack out. It won't peel probably from having not enough millage, but it'll crack. Also, I noticed that there's like no shininess. Yeah, like it's matte all on the dull, it's flat. Compared. Remember the black GTX that I uh, did recently? I brought it in and buffed it out. We had detailed it. We had painted the car and restored it 13 years ago. I brought it in from setting outside and it looked like a sheet of glass. Yeah, it's beautiful. That's what you want to do when you're doing a car that's going to last a long time. I'm going to go first, DP90 it. So it's a nice sealer. Any imperfections that might be in there, it'll fill them. In this process, it was already primered, so we were good there. So you just mix it a different ratio. You mix that different ratio, then it just becomes a sealer. Okay, let's take a look at the Dutchman panel you can see from here. Yeah, you got the Dutchman and the see quarter. See the rest? Right. But look at how thick the millage is right there. Oh, it's a lot What do you think is underneath that black paint right Primer. There? 
and uh, Bondo filler. Yeah, yeah, that's more what I was trying to say. Okay, Bondo. so they used filler Hi. right over the top of the bare metal, and probably the bare metal was not clean when they did it, so that's why it let go. The metal underneath everything, the very raw metal, had filler put over it. That's what we have to do sometimes, folks. You may not like it, but the factory used filler, and it's made for a reason. But it's still, the filler, just like the paint, has to go over fresh, shiny metal. It can go over the epoxy, too. But what it can't go over is rust. Somebody did body work over rust. It started to rust. They moved it and smoothed it and made it all pretty, and then they went to their paint, and it probably looked great for five or 10 years but it will fail. When you get metal clean, it comes back from the dipper and you scotch bread it and you use the wax and grease on it and it's shiny and beautiful. You gotta protect it that minute. You don't get to come back the next day. The minute bare metal is exposed, it starts to flash rust. And then at that point, I got about a day to get on top of it and spray it. And that's what's great about the DP90. So if you walk out there and you see bare metal sitting out there, you slug somebody right in the neck. Okay. Take out a collarbone. You ever had a collarbone busted? No. Yeah, me either. When you see Will working on something, when you see Will painting something, you know that that metal was cleaned. It was cleaned with the proper cleaners that to avoid a millage failure from not having it thick enough that they count the number of coats that they put on, they follow the manufacturer's recommendation for it. And at the end of the day, when you see that paint laid out, it's not just beautiful, but it'll also last a lifetime. So I did three or four coats of the Hemi Orange, the EV2. And then at that point, you just hang your gun up and walk away. I'm not sure if it's some, a part that we're gonna cut and buff. I'm hoping we're not, because it gives it that real feel to it. We didn't cut and buff the spoiler, so I'm hoping we're not gonna end up having to cut and buff the nose. But it has a real great factory look to it. Uh, now that that's completely wrapped up, I am done with the car. And that's exciting, because I can move on to the next. But then I also get to sit back and watch Justin build this thing. You know, those nose cones, there's just a lot of moving parts and pieces to them. It's not easy, it's a pain in the butt to work around. But as far as the paint and body side go, we're done with that car and we could jump on now. In season nine, episode 11 of Graveyard Cars, we restored a 1970 Dodge Challenger in FF5 green. It had sales code A47. What does that sales code mean? Is it formal roof, power seats, rear window defogger? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. We'll let you know how you did. All right, welcome back, ghouls. Now, how did you do on that one? A47, does that mean it was formal roof, power seats, or rear window defogger? If you said formal roof, you are right. This car is an SE. That's what the A47 stands for, a special edition, requiring it to have the overhead consolette with a formal roof. In addition to that, just a few other options it had. M44, rear of hood and fender moldings. M31, belt moldings. M. 42 stone guard moldings, M85 bumper guards, and P31 power windows. To top it all off, the legendary wrestler, Mr. Bill Goldberg, helped us install the drivetrain in that bad boy. Thanks for watching Graveyard Cars Trivia. This was a great opportunity to go over the paint failures on Goldberg's CUDA, show exactly what the results are of not doing something right in the beginning. So that's great. I'm glad that she now knows what to look for as we move forward. And with that done, we're able to go on to the validating part of this 446 barrel four speed CUDA. The red hockey stick, just so you know, there's two problems with that hockey stick on this car. What do you think they are? It's not on the fin, the VIN tag. It's not on the fender tag. That's fender true. Tag. Yeah, very good. Is placement? On? No, no, it looks like it's good. placed pretty good. Sure. Yeah. Okay, what's the other thing? You couldn't get a red hockey stick stripe from the factory. Oh my gosh. That was a dealer installed accessory. Glossy black hockey stick stripe was the only option, depending on the engine, that would call out Hemi 383 340 The red one was something you could go into direct connection. With. That's what they call the performance end of the Mopar parts back in the day was direct connection and say, I love the hockey stick stripe, but I want it in red. People have been doing it for 50 years, and I think that's what happened on Goldberg's car. So after everything with the exterior of the car, at least we still got the engine and the transmission. Even though we're gonna have to do a complete restoration and change everything on the outside, this car is still very valuable. It's still all original when it comes to that. Bill should be happy. One of the cars that's been sitting around here for a long time 
is a 1968 Hemi Charger RT. This is a factory yellow car, black interior, four speed track pack, and all numbers matching. So we're finally getting around to disassembling it. Doug and Eli are gonna do the tear down on it. I just wanna talk about the fact that this car is so pure. You know, the disassembly of these cars is more important now than they've ever been. There's documentation that has to happen. So you have to have competent guys. Eli's come a real long way, that's Doug's son. He's doing a great job of following in his dad's footsteps of caution. Caution is the name of the game around here. If you break an interior garnish molding that isn't reproduced, Tony's Mopar parts doesn't make it, Class Industries doesn't have it, nobody's got it, you're screwed. The downside to it is Doug has oddities and the strangest little things on a car will catch him. Doug will pull a vacuum can out from underneath the battery, which is just a vacuum can that holds the reserve vacuum to let the headlight doors pop open, and he's mesmerized by it. I've walked past him and seen him sitting there staring at something for five minutes. I mean, caution's good, but how excited can you get over a vacuum can? Uh, I love him. Not that I don't love him, you know, but something wrong, you know. That dog don't hunt. Protocol has changed a lot around here. Once a car like the 68 Charger gets disassembled, it used to be that we would take it apart, find a hole for it somewhere. We had 40 foot containers, stick everything in there. And then when it came time to restore the car, we'd pull the parts out. Now, to a degree, there is some of that still, especially major components. But for the most part, now that Eli is here and he's able to handle the reconditioning of the parts that go back on the car, the first thing we do after everything comes off the car, inventory it, then recondition the piece right now. Why not? You can do it today or you can do it tomorrow. So he'll do whatever blasting he has to do to it, treating, painting, plating, sublet. That allows us not to have to be at the mercy of that part when it comes time to put the car together. Once that's done, all those parts can go in the dedicated storage unit. They can go out back and get stacked up on top of each other. Like I said, three high if you have to. Organization, streamline and get these cars in get them torn apart, get them restored, and get the taillights out. I believe wholeheartedly this car is a real V-code car. And when you start at the very back of the car and you work your way to the front, you'll see the, the correct E-body Dana with the correct tags on it that looks like it's been in there its entire life. Can you make that out right there, 3.54? Okay. okay, it's 354 Dana. This car is a 354 A33 car. It's a four-speed car, mandatory Dana on all 440 cars, whether it's 440, 446, or also mandatory on the 426 Hemi. Whoever did the restoration years ago never pulled that rear end out. And it looks okay. to me, looking at that DNA, look at the rust and the crust, how long that looks like it's been in there. It's not a transplant. There's nothing weird. But it helps me now because it doesn't have a bunch of aftermarket fasteners holding it in place where I have to scratch my head and say, well, now is that original or not? That rear end's been in there. Notice okay. the 11-inch drums because it's a drum brake car all the way around. See the front torque boxes in place, factory welds. Now, we've talked about torque boxes before. We'll just stay on an E-body right now. It is a piece of steel that ties the frame rail in the front to the outer rocker to the side of the firewall. And then on the rear, it connects the rocker to the frame rail to the leaf spring perch. Other torque box right here. If you had a 440 E-body with a four barrel, 446 barrel certainly goes without saying, or the 426 Hemi, you are guaranteed these reinforcement torque boxes. It just gives you that extra reinforcement to keep the car from twisting. See the captive washer style nuts? Those are all factory. Reinforcement for the leaf yep. spring hanger. Look up in there, see that plate? Oh yeah. The leaf spring reinforcement plates are in place. Again, six pack or Hemi only. Even a convertible wouldn't have that. This car has it and they've been in there forever. Those are the DNA markers. You look at the bottom side of the car, it's original factory undercoating car. It's obvious that the undercoating is original. You work your way forward, that car is pure and clean. I believe the body started life as a real 446 barrel car, or at least a 440 car. The fact that I've got a fender tag and the original hump is in the floor and I know it's a four speed and the rest of the markers are there, that's what tells me this is a 446 barrel four speed 70 Cuda. Talk engine transmission, I'll tell you one thing is that oil pan's not right. That's not the seven quart deep pan. Okay, what? So, well, the engine's out of a... 1969 Chrysler, a great big car. It's a CH 43K. It's not even an HP engine. It's a regular 350 horse. So that means. So that's not the original engine. Bill knows that, right? Not when I talk to him. Okay. 
Great. My question is, how the heck did we come this far and are we just now finding out that this is not the correct engine? Now the thing is, the car's been here for almost four years, so if we were gonna find a numbers matching problem on a car, he probably would have liked to have known about it four years ago so we could have done something, so that's on us. Let's check the transmission. That's great. 8G. So that's how, the transmission's out of a 1968. It's got the dual bolt pattern extension housing, which is 71 to 74 B body and 70 to 74 E body. The E bodies, the 70 to 74 E bodies and the 71 to 74 B bodies. In order for the transmission to have the location for the shifter to be next to the driver, it had to be moved back down that tail shaft. Prior to that, there was one mounting boss at the front of the extension housing. That would be for your B bodies and your A bodies. So what Chrysler did was they took that extension housing and they added an extra boss at the back to be able to mount this. This transmission has that. And what I'm saying is the extension housing probably is off of a 70 to 74 E body, while the rest of the transmission, obviously by looking at the VIN that's left on it, is a 68 B body something. So they took two transmissions to make it into an E body. Very common back in the day, even, even still today. Okay. So the engine so... transmission don't match. Okay. So that's you'll great. need to call Bill. No, you'll need to call him. I'm not calling him at uh, all. He's your friend. That's your job. I think the fact that Goldberg uh, is a violent man. What if he has some one of those Brock Lesnar flashbacks while I'm talking to him and all of a sudden he just goes berserk? He ain't going to do that with Alyssa. He ain't wrestled no woman ever that I know of. Okay. I well, think it's a good skill set for you right now. Wait, what? No. Look, I had to do it to Jim Root. Okay, I know. Think I and you did that? great. I did you great did because job. I'm the Iceman. I don't have Bill's number. I don't have his email. I don't have any I am the Iceman. So you should just... Cuckoo ca -choo. Okay. So you could probably find the original engine, maybe? Maybe? No, but I happen to have some F440 HPs that would be perfect for it. Plus, I have yeah, an okay, 18 spine four speed. I'm not going to call Bill. So if that's just, it is what it is. I'm not doing it. And I'm getting a little too old and fragile to have my face drop kicked. You shouldn't anywhere. act so tough when he comes around. I don't know. Huh? Hmm? What you're laughing at, camera boy. I'm not going to call him. Hi, Doug. Royal. It's been a long time. Yeah, good to How see you. How you been? Okay, so today I'm finishing up a Dana rear end for a 69 Charger. I've got the brakes all assembled. It's gonna be a lot easier for me today. So I'm just putting the drums on. I got the springs built out and ready to go. I'm looking forward to this. It's fun working with Doug. He's very knowledgeable. What are you working on? I got a nice big old Dana rear end here for a 69 Charger. You know what those are, don't you? Yes, I do. Yeah, you had a friend with a They're 69 Charger. They're upside down. Char I'm sure he had a reason. I had to say something anyway. The gesture goes on the bottom. Well, I, I like to do it this way so I can reach things, you know? Right? Well, I was just wondering, just making sure, double checking. There you go. I do everything upside down. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. great. No, that was awesome. Yeah, there's no question that Royal is an excellent mechanic. You ever seen one of these things before? Oh, gosh, not since the 80s. 80s? <laughs> Doug? He was a good mechanic long before I was. The tool that Doug handed me was a tool for measuring the diameter of the inside of the drum, and then the other end, would you would bring the shoes out to fit that. I was measured twice, cut once. But when it comes to any kind of dynamism at all, there's something wrong. Or measure once and cuss twice. Here, give me that drum. Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll do it the old-fashioned way. They try to be funny, and it's not funny. It's like watching paint dry. Yeah? <laughs> I usually just turn them up, put the drum on, get a feel for it, turn them up some more until it fits. Sometimes my fingers are the right tool for the job. Got it all propped up here so I can put my leaf springs on. You wanna give me a hand with those? Yeah, you bet. I'll bring one around. You no, know, do something. Snap the other one with a towel, insult him. A mama joke. Why you can't bring back a yo mama joke, right? Yeah, it's been a long time, hasn't it? How about this one? Yo mama is so fat, when she gets on an elevator, it's always going down. <laughs> That's good, I made that up. <laughs> okay, so here's my Whoa. passenger leaf spring. 
when we were working on these cars as kids, we couldn't afford all this nice machinery. So it was laying on our backs in a gravel driveway or under his carport, which was very uneven. Driver's side now? Yeah, this is the driver's side. Your mama is so ugly. Even Hello Kitty says goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> it was, gosh, it's just nice to work with clean stuff. Um, everything goes together good, you know, and more practice makes everything go easier also. I remember the old days when you and Mark were working down there at the other shop. It was entertaining, wasn't it? Working? Yeah. Working? <laughs> working? I just hung around for the entertainment. You don't like the Yo Mama jokes? That's fine. Maybe that's insulting to some people. Go to the knock knock jokes, right? Yeah. right. I'll do one with you. Or knock knock. <laughs> Jame gum. Jame gum. Or you can come in and check out my place. I've, I've got the cards right back here. See if we can perch that spring perch right there on the spring. Knock knock. Who's there? Christopher Walken. There you are, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. They might be outside in. I'd have to go out and look. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Let's go look. Okay. Don't matter to me, but it matters to Mark, and it's important. So we want to get it. You know, we want to get it right. I know. Sorry, those, I know where those go. I'm just not sure if this goes. I think it's inside out. It's been a while since I worked on them. So, so we'll just snug these up finger tight. I thought I better double check. Is there one out there? Oh yeah. Don't want to get called on something like that. One of the cars that we have in the metal shop right now that's up on the frame rack is a 1970 GTX. It's a 440 six barrel automatic car, one of 328 built. We're just doing the body and paint on it. Something really interesting that I see a lot of out in the graveyard. There's over hundred cars out there and how many of them have what we call previous sins. My terminology of previous sin is, it's a euphemism for things that were done really poorly. This car has a bunch of previous sins and I wanted to share what those are with you. And if you don't do a good job, it's going to bite you in the ass later. Before we can do the body and paintwork and repair whatever rust panels it has on it, we have to go back and make sure everything is right from the inside out. So this car was involved in an accident somewhere in the 70s, maybe in the 80s. It got hit hard in this door pillar area. This quarter panel is not the quarter panel that was on it after that accident. It has been replaced. You can tell that it's been replaced because this is the roof skin. This little section here where you see my little hand going along that line, from there down is replacement quarter panel. From there up is what's left of the original quarter panel. It also was put on poorly where they went right over the top of the other quarter panel. They took the biggest pieces off, but that's why the quarter panel fits so terrible. Again, I'll show you that in a minute. Not only is that great evidence of poor workmanship, but the fact that the area inside here is so destroyed and was never fixed, that's what I want to share with you. If you go around inside here, you're going to see that the quarter inner structure itself, the reinforcement piece for the quarter panel, destroyed down low. The rocker extension, inner and outer, both destroyed. The under seat pan, destroyed. Well, repairable, but damaged. And the main floor, the step well area, damaged. Maybe the car was totaled back then and the insurance company said, you know, sayonara, I'm not going to do anything with it. Or maybe it wasn't totaled and it went to a body shop that didn't do very good work. But this car suffers so many previous sins. I'm glad it's here and I'm glad we have the opportunity because we have the right frame pulling equipment to make the necessary pulls to be able to put this car geometrically back where it has to be before we start building it out. Now, one of the first steps you got to do is get that car locked down in the pinch weld clamp. So when you see it on the rack, it's held in place with the strongest parts of a unibody car, which are the pinch welds. It's where the inner rocker meets the outer rocker and the floor is in there to help. So I'm going to cut George loose to get the quarter panel off of here. We have to have it off so we can get access to the damaged area. After that, I'll bring everybody out and show you what it's like to make some pulls on the floors and inner rockers of a 1970 GTX. In season nine, episode 11 of Graveyard Cars, we restored a 1970 Dodge Challenger RTSE. True or false, the transmission behind the 440 Magnum was a four-speed pistol grip. Think you know the answer to that? Stay tuned after the break and we'll let you know how you did.
defense calls Mopar Colonel Mark G. Warman. Colonel, do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give in this general court-martial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, I do. Would you state your name, rank, and current billet for the record, please, sir? Mopar Brand Ambassador Mark G. Warman, Commanding Officer, Graveyard Cars, Ground Forces, Springfield, Oregon. Thank you, sir. Would you have a seat, please? Mr. Ambassador, you said earlier that you ordered Scott not to order mixed number EV2. That's right. And Scott was clear on what you wanted. Crystal. Any chance Scott ignored the order? Ignored the order? Any chance he just forgot about it? No. Any chance Scott left your office and said, the old man's wrong? No. When Scott spoke to the platoon and ordered them not to mix the EV2, any chance they ignored him? Have you ever spent time in a mixing room? No, sir. Ever painted a million dollar car? No, sir. Ever put your skills in another man's hands and asked him to put his skills in yours? No, sir. We follow orders, son. We follow orders or cars die. It's that simple. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Are we clear? Crystal. Mr. Ambassador, if you gave an order that the Tour Red wasn't supposed to be mixed and your orders are always followed, then why would the color be made? Why would it be necessary to look up the formula? Will Scott was a substandard painter. He was being ordered to stand down because he didn't know... that's not what you said. You said he was told not to mix the color. Yes, that's correct. But sometimes men take matters into their own hands. No, sir. You made it clear just a moment ago that your men never take matters into their own hands. Your men follow orders or cars die. So there should have been no chance Willie would mix that color, Mr. Ambassador. You snotty little bastard. If Scott told his men not to mix the paint, he shouldn't have been in any trouble at all. Scott ordered the tour red, didn't he? Because that's what you told him to do. And when it went bad, you cut these guys loose. You had the paint department sign a phony purchase order. You doctored the logbook. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to them. Do you want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. Son, we live in a world that has colors. And those colors have to be mixed by men with paint guns. Who's going to do it? You? You, Lieutenant Gambo? I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You weep for Scott. You curse the industry. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know. That Scott's court-martial, while tragic, probably saved time. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves time. You don't want the truth, because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties. You want me in that booth. You need me in that booth. I use words like tint, hue, opacity. I use these words as a backbone to a life spent painting. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the very spectrum of colors I provide and then questions the manner in which I provide it. I'd rather you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a paint gun and stand the post. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Did you order the tour red? I did the job you sent me to do. Did you order the tour red? You're damn right I did! Please, the court, I suggest the jury be dismissed so that we can move to an immediate FC7 session. The witness has rights. Thank God. Can we go eat now? Okay, guys, welcome back. How did you do on that one? R70 Challenger RT, SE, and FF5. Was it a four-speed manual transmission? If you answered true, well, you're absolutely wrong. That car was an automatic transmission on the floor with the console, making the car one of only 733 built. But in addition to that, it had H51 air conditioning, N88 speed control, V5X body side moldings in black, J46 flip top gas cap, N42 exhaust tips, and P31 power windows, just to name a few. Thanks for watching. So Doug and I went outside to look at the shackle bolts to see which way they went, whether they went from the 
outside in or the inside out. Now, at the end of the day, I like to have a little bit of fun. I like to tease everybody. I mean, definitely Royal and Duggar are a little bit like watching grass grow. But when it comes to being technicians, I'm the best. Okay, we're done. Rear end came out beautiful. It is now ready to install in that car, which is good because that's just another car that we've got to get the drivetrain in it so we can get over and have the headliner put in it, the vinyl top, so it can come back and we can put the car together. So good job, both those guys. So with everything going on in the shop right now, one of the things that we're doing out in the assembly shop is the cutting and buffing of these cars. There's no longer any room down in the paint shop. So Noah currently is working on the wet sand and buff of our 69 Charger Daytona. So we had the Daytona completely done, minus the cut and buff on the hood and the nose. They installed the hood to see how to make sure we had good fitment, good color match, all that stuff. I'm not gonna cut and buff the nose until it's installed on the car, but we can't do that until we get the hood cut and buffed. That's why he was cut and buffing it on the car. It did solvent pop, and that's kind of a concern because that only happens for one of two reasons. Basically what happens is our polyurethane clears and our single stage concept paints, they have a lot of solids in them. As those solvents evaporate out of the paint, which is what they do, that's how it dries. It evaporates, it goes up in the air. If there isn't something pulling it off, they just drop right back down and they cause a little crater. I mean, I'm not trying to blame Will or throw him under the bus, but my guess is he might've gotten a little bit of a hurry or shut the booth off a little bit early. It can happen. Mark actually sprayed the hood and then shut the booth off too early. They are there and they are deep. I can't wet sand those out and buff it. At that particular point, you have to repaint the hood. And that's where we are on our Daytona. Some were deep, some weren't. So I gave the hood over to Noah. Try cutting and buff it, see if you can work it and see if it'll come out. Cause if it can, you don't have to repaint anything. So he worked on it for a little bit, no luck. At that point, you gotta take the hood, bring it back over to the paint shop, get it in the booth, sand it out, reshoot the whole thing, and then give it back to Noah to do the final cut and buff on it, put it on the car, then it's done. When it comes to solvent pop, you gotta have airflow. The second you lay it down, I mean, it's just releasing solvents for hours. And if you don't have airflow, it'll literally drop right back down into it the solvent will, and it just looks like little pop marks all over the whole entire hood. And it's mainly on flat panels. You aren't, you're not gonna get it on the side because when the gases come out, they just drop down or get pulled away. But on the flat panels, they drop right back onto the panel you were painting. So you gotta have the good airflow. Box fans, if you're in a garage, nothing dramatic, just enough to get the air out of there. And if you do get it, Sometimes it is minimal. You can cut and buff it out, but more often than not, you basically just sand it down and reclear it. It seems like you know you can be done with the car and all your paint work's done, it looks great, but then you have the assembly side. But we won't mention any names. There's a ton of people on the assembly side. So right now we are on top of the world. It's just awesome to see the volume of cars that are moving through here. And I know in the past I've said that and you can jinx it. So the town's on fire? Didn't see that one coming. Didn't see that one coming. Armageddon.